Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're going to take uh, a brief detour and just one single devotion from the book of Isaiah because I want to follow up with what we saw in yesterday's devotion. Hezekiah is foolish. He displays all of this wealth to this king from Babylon who is curious after seeing uh, this interstellar miracle that the Lord had done evidently on Hezekiah's behalf. Hezekiah displays all the wealth and then Babylon takes it all, and there's this proclamation from Isaiah to Hezekiah that it's all going to be taken, and then even, even your sons from your household will be made eunuchs in the house of Babylon, like descendants from your family will suffer. So I want to give you a snapshot of what follows in Hezekiah's family legacy. Here is 2 Chronicles chapter 33 into the first two verses of chapter 34, all right, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. This is Hezekiah's son. So everything happens pretty quickly. We have the story about Hezekiah being told by God, you're going to fall ill, you're going to die. Hezekiah prays, he weeps, he goes before the Lord. The Lord extends his life, confirms it with the very same miracle, by the way, that attracted the attention of the king of Babylon. And then the Lord delivers him and then years go by and then he passes away. And uh, with this with this eerie proclamation that came from Isaiah, this prophecy that would come from the Lord regarding the descendants of Hezekiah, who was really all in all, it was a great king. He loved the Lord. He followed God. He was not perfect, but his overall legacy is one of faithfulness to God. His son Manasseh was a holy terror. Here's chapter 33 of Second Chronicles. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. That's a long reign. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, imitating the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had dispossessed before the Israelites. All right, so for 400 years, Leviticus 18 chronicled some of the grotesque practices that were pervasive throughout the land of Canaan. And for these, for centuries, God told them, repent, or I'm going to pour out my wrath. Repent, I'm going to pour out my wrath. They didn't repent, so God poured out his wrath. And now some of those same practices are coming back, and they're showing up in now, not just Israel, I mean, ancient Judah. This is generational, generations ago, um, where the Israelites were told to wipe these practices out completely, and they had not. Now they're adopting some of those same practices. He rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had torn down. Man, I was meeting with two men from the Redemption Church this morning at at IHOP, not the charismatic church, but the pancake place, and uh, had steak and eggs, man, like one of the most American breakfasts ever. If that was invented in America, if that was invented somewhere else, please, uh, please, please tell me in the comments below. But to me, it just seems like it just seems like us. And we were talking about generational conversions, how, wow, if the gospel intervenes in the the lifetime of, you know, of a man who's far from God, then his children will benefit from that. I mean, like I've benefited directly from the Holy Spirit just miraculously changing my father's life, you know, and my bringing my mom into his life and how I just continue to reap the benefits of that. My testimony is inextricably linked to the, the testimony of my father. But what we see in the book of, of Second Chronicles is sort of the, uh, the reversal, uh, wherein you have a saved man, as in speaking in the Old Testament sense of, of, of saved, saved by Jesus, but Jesus wasn't born for another seven centuries. Um, and then his son goes absolutely haywire. And what we saw in yesterday's devotion at the end of Isaiah chapter 39, it's only eight verses long, but the eighth verse seems like, Hezekiah's final words, it, it, that to me is the greater folly in chapter 39. He's like, well, at least there's going to be peace and security in my lifetime. And it's like, wow, Hezekiah, for such a great king, for such a godly guy, uh, such an excellent prayer, prayer, a prayer of prayers, you're a really bad father. <laughs> like, you don't give a rip that your your sons are going to suffer wrath in part for what you've done, but evidently, he doesn't really seem to care about his kid's spiritual development because his son, Manasseh, uh, is only a kid when his father dies. He's only 12 years old, and he rebuilds the high places. Manasseh, Manasseh's very existence, by the way, is a miracle of God. Hezekiah was supposed to die. The Lord added 15 years onto his life. 
And because this text says that Manasseh was 12 years old when he reigns, that means that it would be another three years before Manasseh was even conceived. Uh, and those three of the those are three of the 15, the, the first three of the 15 years that God added on to Hezekiah's life. So Manasseh has no concept of the miraculous deliverance, you know, of, of the people of God. He has no concept of the miraculous addition onto his father's life because he literally took that for granted because for him it kind of was. He was just born into it. Uh, and he's, he is now rebuilding high places that his, he's undoing what his father had done. This is the reversal of the kind of spiritual legacy that we want. Can you be honest for a minute though? Is it, was that you? Like, were, were you the, the problem child, the prodigal? Uh, like, were you the unspoken prayer request in your parents' small group for like 20 years? All right, you, you probably have some, uh, some way in which you can relate to Manasseh because he's going to look like an absolute holy terror, but his story is not done yet. All right, we'll just get a quick glance at what happens even a couple of generations later. This is, this is fascinating. This is, this is important. He rebuilt the high places and reestablished the altars for the Baals, or Baal worship. He made Asherah poles that, all right, uh, you know, kind of PG-13 moment. Uh, Asherah poles were phallic images. Right, what kind of, what kind of perverse practice is this? All right, but it also does, I'll be honest, it paints a really funny photo in my head, you know, the, of when they would bring this worship practice back, inevitably what it meant was just kind of giving into sexual sin. Pagan worship often involves, really it's just, it's just enticed by lust, okay? Like unpopular truth, uh, that's part of the appeal of Islam for men. They want to, you know, if they commit acts of jihad, they believe that they receive a, a, a world full of virgins that they can just have sex with, all right? This was part of the appeal and even original mandate of the Mormon faith. You know, you basically become a god of your universe, and this is big giant harem. Brigham Young taught that this was act, this act of po uh, polygamy was actually necessary for salvation, and then Asherah worship was the same thing. So when they would repent from this, it meant that they had to destroy <laughs> these giant phallic images, and that's just it, somebody had to laugh, right? Like it had to be a little bit like, can we acknowledge how funny this is? <laughs> like we're tearing down this giant Asherah pole, and he bowed down and worshipped to all the stars in the sky. Okay, think Romans 1. Uh, rather than worshiping the Creator, they worship the things that the Creator created uh, and served them. See how futile that is? He built altars in the Lord's temple where the Lord had said, Jerusalem is where my name will remain forever. He built altars to all the stars in the sky in both courtyards of the Lord's temple. He passed his sons through the fire in Ben Hinnom Valley. All right, this has, th this means that he murdered his kids. This is, this is where we get the imagery for hell from. All right, the, the valley of, of uh, the, the valley of, of Ben Hinnom or Gehenna or Topheth. This is where the worship of Molech and Chemosh was carried out and they basically murdered their children in fire for the sake of having a better life. It's something that persists today through abortion. Let me murder my kid so I can have a better life. Or human population is growing too much. We need to save the planet. And so I'm going to have an abortion so as to reduce the legacy of my carbon footprint. I'm going to, I'm going to kill my children to change the weather. That was what happened in Ben Hinnom Valley. And nobody, modern, modern pro-choice advocates have no concept of what Ben Hinnom is or Gehenna. Hopefully they never will. Hopefully they'll repent and be saved, be drawn by the Spirit, called by the Father, confess that Jesus is Lord and repent and be saved forever. But they have brought back these ancient practices. He practiced witchcraft divination, trying to determine, you know, through uh, just, I don't know, funny tricks and stuff like what, what the truth was, but really it's all just being deceived by, by evil and sorcery. Okay. Some people are convinced by signs and wonders and not all signs and wonders are from God and consulted mediums. I'm glad that this trend is, is, uh, is over for a little while there. We had a lot of reality shows like on mediums on TV today. 
and spiritists. He did a huge amount of evil in the Lord's sight, angering him. Manasseh set up a carved image of the idol which he had made in God's temple that God had spoken about to David and his son Solomon. I will establish my name forever in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. I will never again remove the feet of the Israelites from the land where I stationed your ancestors. If only they will be careful to do all I have commanded them through Moses, all the laws, statutes, and judgments. So Manasseh caused Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to stray. So they did worse evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. It looks bad, right? Aren't you glad this is not the end of the story? Let me know in the comments if you are kind of like Manasseh. You're like, oh man, I was, I must, if you're one of those whose parents raised you in the Lord, you know, they weren't perfect, but they showed you the gospel and then you just went the opposite direction like Manasseh. And then you can relate. Tell me if verse 10 tells your story. Tell me in the comments, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they didn't listen. So he brought against them the military commanders of the king of Assyria. They captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. When see, this is what was this is a fulfillment of yesterday's prophecy we saw. When he was in distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and earnestly humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. How many of you have that kind of testimony? Like my dad loved the Lord, and I just went the opposite way. And then, man, there I was in the pit, and uh, I was in distress, and so I sought the favor of the Lord. I humbled myself before the God of my ancestors. Isn't this cool, man? This is a story of a prodigal son who's come back. I mean, he was, he was the worst king Judah had ever seen, and now he's repentant. He prayed to him, and the Lord was receptive to his prayer. He granted his request and brought him back to Jerusalem to his kingdom. So Manasseh came to know that the Lord is God. If that's your testimony, comment, I am Manasseh. <laughs> I was running the opposite way against God, and now I've come to know that the Lord is God. And then watch, this is a beautiful story of repentance. After this, he built the outer wall of the city of David from west of the Gihon in the valley to the entrance of the fish gate. He brought it around Ophel and he heightened it considerably. He went from adding Asherah poles in high places and even sacrificing his own children, okay, to making Jerusalem better than it was. He also placed military commanders in the fortified cities of Judah. He removed the foreign gods and the idol from the Lord's temple, along with all the altars that he had built on the mountain of the Lord's temple and in Jerusalem, and he threw them outside the city. He built the altar of the Lord and offered fellowship and thanksgiving sacrifices on it. So this looks good, right? But watch what comes next. Then he told Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. However, the people still sacrificed at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. So it's a slight corruption of what was actually prescribed for worship to take place in the temple, but at least they're making sacrifices to God, right? So the, the full repentance, the cultural impact of his poor leadership before wasn't a hundred percent realized in the people. They saw him repent and they repented themselves, but you can still see this slight corruption of the practice for worship and sacrifice as was prescribed. The rest of the events of Manasseh's reign, along with his prayer to God and the words of the, uh, of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, are written in the events of Israel's kings. His prayer and how God was receptive to his prayer and all his sin and unfaithfulness and the sites where he built high places and set up Asherah poles and carved images before he humbled himself, they're written in the events of Hosea. Manasseh rested with his ancestors and he was buried in his own house, his son Amon became king in his place. So Isaiah would not speak to Manasseh or Amon or Josiah. He began with uh, Uzziah and then, uh, was it, who's the next? Uh, Uzziah and Ahaz, right? Uh, um, forgive me, I'm drawing a blank on exactly who came next. It was uh, Uzziah, Jotham, and then Ahaz, and then Hezekiah. Sorry, I had to, had to look at that for a second. Here's, here, uh, here, here's what comes next, another generation after that. After Manasseh's death, uh, Amon shows up, and he was 
22 years old when he became king. Because remember, his dad Manasseh was king for 55 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father Manasseh had done. So we go from Hezekiah, who was righteous, but really didn't pay attention to his son. Manasseh, who at first was, I mean, like an absolute abomination of a king, and then he repented. But guess what? His son Amon uh, was paying attention to what his dad had done originally. Uh, Amon sacrificed all the carved images that his father Manasseh had made, and he served them, but he did not humble himself before the Lord like his father Manasseh had humbled himself. Instead, Amon increased his guilt. So we can see further evidence of the prophecy that Isaiah, the very last prophecy that he I, Hezekiah ever heard from Isaiah and responded to so bizarrely and so flippantly, right? It, it's coming true multiple generations later from Manasseh to Amon. So his servants conspired against him and put him to death in his own house. The common people killed all who had conspired against King Amon, and they made his son Josiah king in his place. And then I could go on and on about Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the Lord's sight and walked in the ways of his ancestor David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And then the text that follows is the story of Josiah, uh, I mean, eradicating all of the places of idolatry that his father and grandfather had put up. Manasseh didn't co totally clean house, as you saw, and that kind of left the, the door cracked for that idolatry to creep back in. And so Amon just took it to another level from his dad. The difference between Amon and Manasseh is that Manasseh actually humbled himself, repented, came to see that the Lord is God. Amon had no such conversion experience, speaking in the Old Testament sense, but Josiah, Josiah did. Josiah actually brought the people back uh, into the proper worship of the Lord and, and demolished the high places. A gospel testimony could be generational and could be received well, but could also be extinct. If you have inherited a gospel legacy from your parents, would you pass that legacy forward to your children? If you inherited, I mean, a legacy of depravity and rebellion against God or even pagan worship, would you write a new legacy? Whether you have kids or not, even if you don't have children, if you, even if you're single, you can do this. Do you realize that, right? You don't have to have kids to change your family legacy by the power of the gospel. If you live within the Lord's will, you have written a new legacy for your family. Pray that your children receive it as well. Our children are very much a measure of our effectiveness for the kingdom of God. It has to begin in our own homes. Even the pastoral epistles would say that, a, that a, a pastor is disqualified if his children are open to the accusation of being rebellious. That's scary, right? Pray for me. So far, my kids are, are walking with the Lord, but my oldest is only 13 now. You know, he hasn't gone Amon yet. You know, he might one day. Here's what I pray, though. We have to, we have to be as gracious to the Hezekiahs as we are to the Manassehs. When, you know, the star quarterback or pitcher in the high school team who also has a side gig selling drugs, like when he radically gets saved and comes to the Lord, everybody's like, wow, that's amazing. You, we've been telling you you're amazing the whole time, even when you were a drug dealer. You're an amazing drug dealer. Now you're an amazing Christian, All right? The Manassas are surrounded by love and support and book deals. But what about the Hezekiahs? What about the ones who walk with the Lord, but then they, they do stumble? To be sure, Hezekiah knew better. That's what, that's what really stinks for the Christians who mess up. It's because they knew better. But we as Christians, let's be honest, we tend to show them zero grace. Treat them like pariahs, outcasts. We're nicer to the repentant drug dealers than we are to the Christians who stumble. Remember that the Hezekiahs are due the same grace as are the Manassehs. Christians are currently, based on what I've experienced, what I've seen, the worst about this. Let's make that better. Let's make that better. Celebrate the repentance of the Hezekiahs as much as you would the repentance of the Manassehs. Because even though the Hezekiahs knew better, the Manassehs certainly did more damage by their 
repeated behaviors of sin across years rather than the episodic or isolated failures of someone who followed the Lord and gave in to temptation. This is a prayer for generational inheritance. Let's pray for our descendants now. Okay, we prayed yesterday for our kids. Let's pray for any descendants that the Lord may give us hereafter. God, we sang a worship song to you. Lord, I, I prayed a blessing from Deuteronomy 6 over the people of the Redemption Church for their children and their children and their children and their children. And Lord, I pray it again now. We've seen how Hezekiah walked with you. He wasn't perfect, but you loved him. And then his son Manasseh, Lord, departed from your ways, but then you humbled him. He acknowledged that you were Lord. He repented. But God, some of his old ways still influenced his son Amon. I pray, Lord, for every listener who's inherited a ministry of the gospel from their parents, they would pay it forward. If there are Manassas right now whose parents did everything right, but they've just rebelled against you, I pray that they would, true to this biblical legacy, repent, repent, repent. And I pray, Lord, for those whose parents have not demonstrated the gospel at all, I pray that they would create a new legacy of repentance that is exhibited in any children you may give them, any grandchildren you may give them, any great-grandchildren, it is the earnest prayer of our hearts that generationally, God, as we get married, as we have children, as our children get married and have children and walk in your ways, O oh God, that we would have covenant families who are missing no members in glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to continue through the book of Isaiah. We've got a lot more to cover, and it's going to get more and more messianic, especially in uh, tomorrow's sermon. I'll see you then.